What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Vegas 89. We got Rose Namajunas going against Amanda Hebas. And we are back for another full card breakdown and prediction video. This week, we are right back in the apex for UFC Vegas 89, headlined by Rose Namajunas and Amanda Hibas. We got 13 fights on the board. Looking forward to breaking it down. As always, I am here um, trying to get the video out on a Monday. Did everything in my power today to to push through it, you know, go out there and, and tape uh, all these fighters. Um, there's some new ones. There's uh, Daria Zelenikova. Uh, we got Andre Lima, Igor Da Silva. We got uh, Stephen Wynn making his debut. We got some guys making their debut. So, yeah, um, it was definitely a lot of extra work this week for some unknowns. But, yeah, got it all done and, and ready to, to break down some fights. Before we get into it, if you guys could please do me a favor, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. If you do want to support me more, be sure to check out DFSbythenumbers.com. There you'll find all my other content. I'll be honest, I'm probably not going to have a ton of bets on this card. just seems like a coin flippy type card where, like, I can make a case for every single underdog. Like, the biggest favorite on the card right now is, is Rose Nama Yunus. Um, but I'm going to be looking into UFC Atlantic City next for, for next week. I'm going to be looking into those fights probably after I get done with uh, the content this week. And then also we have UFC 300 coming up as well. So, yeah, not going to have a ton of action this card, um, but I'm going to have a ton of action for Atlantic City and UFC 300 for sure. And then lastly, do want to shout out Prize Picks. Uh, this show is brought to you by Prize Picks. If you guys have not checked it out, be sure to enter the promo code at DFSPTN and you'll get a 100% deposit match up to $100. It helps me. It helps you. And, um, yeah, I think that is about it, guys. All right, let's get into these fights. And you know me. I mean, I I try to be as as positive as possible. People like people don't like when I when I crap on a card. So I'm gonna try to be positive here. Um, and we're kicking it off with Mick Parkin and Muhammad Usman. We got Mick Parkin, 28 years old, six foot four with a 79 inch reach, eight and zero, and five and zero in his last five fights. Muhammad Usman, he's 34 years old, six foot two with a 79 inch reach, 10 and two, and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. And we have a Mick Parkin opening up minus 190. He is currently minus 155. And the Muhammad Usman open up plus 165, currently plus 135. And what I'll say right off the bat is we have a lot of very closely lined fights. Um, I believe at time of recording, there is only one fighter minus 200 and or greater, and that is Rose Namajunas. Other than that, a lot of these fights are very closely lined, including this one. So I think the fights are going to be very interesting. I think there's going to be... Um, a lot of different opinions on a lot of these fights, and yeah, this could be one of them. But for me, I'm more so on the Mick Parkin side. I'm not a, a big fan of either of these guys. I don't think either guy is is that great. I don't think either guy has much upside. But you know, kind of how I'm seeing the fight playing out is, I feel like this fight is primarily going to be standing. You know, maybe Muhammad Usman's able to potentially mix in some takedowns here. But on the feet, I do like Mick Parkin. I like his striking. It's weird though. Like Mick Parkin went out there. In his debut against Jamal Pogues, his striking looked really good, uh, like very good against Jamal Pogues. Outlanded him 95 to 36, and then against you know Kyle Machado, his next fight, his striking looked terrible. It's like, what what happened, McParkin? Um, so that was kind of weird. But I still think he's a, a solid striker. I believe he's the guy that's training with Tom Aspinall. And yeah, yeah, solid striker Mick Parkin. I believe he has some uh, you know, underrated BJJ as well. So yeah, uh, should be able to keep this fight standing for the most part. And at range, I think it's going to be one of those fights where it's Mick Parkin absolutely doing the better work, landing more strikes. But it's going to be Muhammad Usman who's just going to be landing probably the bigger shots. But uh, Muhammad Usman's very low volume, uh, just doesn't really throw much. You know, the, the fight with Zach Palga. He was on his way to losing that fight, was getting outlanded. The guy landed 11 strikes um, through the first like round, round and a couple seconds into the second round. And then that 12th strike he landed knocked out Zach Palga. So Usman does have the power advantage, but I don't think he's knocking out Parkin. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking Mick Parkin here. I'm taking him to win this fight by decision. Moving on, I think we have a very fun fight here. You know, these are two newcomers that are going to go after it. I think it's a... Uh, Probably one of the better fights on the entire card, and it's the second fight on this 13-fight card. So we got Andre Lima going against Igor 
Uh, De Silva, we got Andre Lima, 25 years old, 5'7", with a 67.5-inch reach, 7-0, and, and obviously 5-0 in his last five fights. Igor De Silva, 20 years old, 5'7", with a 69.5-inch reach, 8-0, and, and he's 5-0 and in his last five fights. So we have two guys who are both undefeated, two guys that are both coming off of the Contender Series, um, and we have Andre Lima, who is the favorite. Opened at minus 125, he's minus 180. And Igor De Silva opened up plus 105, he's currently plus 155. So yeah, I'm a big fan of both these guys. You know, what, what sticks out right away is how young these guys are. Andre Lima, only 25 years old. Uh, Igor De Silva, only 20 years old. I believe Igor De Silva started fighting when he was like 15 or 16 uh, years old, professionally. It's it's crazy, but yeah, I think the you know Igor De Silva is probably going to be the, the more aggressive guy here. He's uh, has that killer be killed type style where he does leave a lot of openings. He's very hittable, but he's very aggressive. I like that. He'll come forward and he can wrestle. You he can definitely get takedowns, get the fight down to the mat. Andre Lima, kind of a like a lackluster fight on his contender series fight, but I think it was more due to his opponent. Uh, the Zenadim guy who just quite frankly just didn't show up. It was the weirdest performance ever. Like Zenadim decided just to not fight that night. I don't know what happened there, but yeah, I mean, you know, Lima did what he needed to do. He pressured the entire time. I liked that and was able to just easily win the fight because Zenadim was not throwing anything back at him. So pretty easy win there. But yeah, this is a guy in you know, Igor De Silva who is absolutely going to be throwing stuff at him. And I think he can wrestle as well. This line... Kind of confuses me a little bit. You know, I think this should be a, a closer to a pick. I mean, I could say that for pretty much every single fight on this card. But this is a fight that I do think should be lying closer to a pick. Em. I think Lima's definitely more defensively sound. But I, like I said, I think De Silva's going to be more aggressive. I think De Silva can get takedowns here. So I'm kind of leaning the dog here in De Silva. And I will pick De Silva to win this fight by decision. I think it's a close fight, like the majority of the fights on this card. Moving on, we got uh, Daria Zelenikova going against Montserrat Rendon. We got Zelenikova, who is 28 years old, 5'9", 8-1, and 4-1 and and in her last five fights. Rendon, she is... Actually, she is 35 years old, my bad. Typo. She's 35 years old, 5'8", uh, with a 68-inch reach, 6-0, and 5-0 and and in her last five fights. So... Yeah, we have Zelnikova is going to be making her debut. Um, that one loss that Zelnikova did have was against Melissa Dixon, who is in the UFC. Melissa Dixon was the fighter that went out there and took on Irina Alexeva her last fight out. So, yeah, um, striker versus grappler matchup here. You know, Zelnikova is a very good striker, striking background. Um, I love her hand speed. She has really good power as well. I saw her fight Luana Jojua, who used to be in the UFC and just beat her up across three rounds. Good performance there. I guess the big hole in Zelnikova's game potentially is going to be the ground game, the takedown defense. Like I said, we've seen you know Melissa Dixon take her down, and she pounded her out in the first round. And yeah, Rendon's gonna have a path here. Um, you know, I don't like the fact that Rendon is 35 years old. I don't like the fact that she uh, has never finished anybody ever. She's six and zero, all six wins coming by decision but you know she in theory could potentially get this fight down to the mat but uh i'm more on the zelnikova side i was really impressed with their striking here i think she should be able to win enough minutes on the feet to, to win this fight and one thing i've noticed with uh the judging as of late as of late is they're not really scoring control time like at all uh they're putting a huge emphasis and and a focus on the the damage right um which is kind of how it should be, but I'm just glad we're getting a little bit more consistency in the judging as of late. They're, they're scoring damage over control just a lot more. Like, in, in some fights, they're borderline just completely ignoring control. Like, for example, the Dolgarian Christian Rodriguez fight. I think two judges somehow, some way scored the second round for uh, Christian Rodriguez against Dolgarian. So even if Rendon is able to take down Zelnikova and does nothing on the, on the mat... You know, Zelnikova on the feet is just going to be the much better striker and landing much more strikes on the feet. So, yeah, cause give me give me Zelnikova here. Zelnikova to win this fight by decision. Moving on, we got Steven Wynn going against Jarno Ahrens. Uh, we got Steven Wynn, 30 years old, 5'11", with a 73-inch reach, 9-1, 4-1 in his last five fights. Jarno Ahrens, 29 years old, 5'11", 73-inch reach, 13-5-1. And two and three in his last five fights, we have Stephen Wynn opened up minus 185, currently minus 180. Jarno Aaron's opened up plus 160, currently plus 160. So, yeah, I mean, 
again, I'll, I'll say this for a lot of these fights. I'm not high on either guy here uh, whatsoever. But, you know, I got to go in here just based off the fact that he actually does stuff when he's in the cage. I mean, Jarno Aarons, um, you know, thus far in his UFC career, just very, very low volume. Like, if you're getting outlanded by William Gomez, like, something's seriously wrong. Because William Gomez is somebody that doesn't throw anything in his own right. So, yeah, that decision loss against Gomez, he only landed 20 strikes. Had a decision loss against Sung Woo Choi, only landed 30 strikes. Like, that's 50 strikes in... In, in 30 minutes in the cage, Journal Aaron. So, yeah, how am I going to pick somebody to win that just doesn't let his hands go? Like, this guy's landing 1.67 significant strikes per minute. So just by default, I'm going with Stephen Wynn, who's the complete opposite. Like, Stephen Wynn, although I don't think he's the best fighter in the world, he's very, very high volume. He's very active on the feet. Um, he's been on the Contender Series um, three times. He's 2-1 and one in those fights, and throughout those three fights, he's landing 8.29 significant strikes. So much, much more active. Landed 103 significant strikes on A.J. Cunningham's face in nine minutes, um, and then landed um, like 126 the fight before that, even landed 92 against a long cruise. So, yeah, minute for minute, it's going to be Stephen Wynn. I also think Stephen Wynn's tough, so I, I kind of think Jarno Aarons is going to be finish or bust. I think, um, you know, Stephen Wynn might even be able to get takedowns here potentially. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going with Wynn here. Like I said, I'm not in love with the guy um, as a fighter, but I'm going to pick him to win this fight by decision just because he actually – does, does stuff in the cage. So give me Steven Wynn by decision. Moving on, we have Miles Johns going against Cody Gibson. We got Miles Johns, 29 years old, 5'7", with a 66-inch reach, 13-2 and and 3, 1-1, one and one, no contest. His last five fights, Cody Gibson, 36 years old, 5'10", with a 71-inch reach, 19-9, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. Uh, Miles Johns open up minus 150, currently minus 150. Cody Gibson open up plus 130, currently plus 130. So yeah, uh, Miles Johns is taking this fight on short notice. It was supposed to be Cody Gibson, I believe, against Davey Grant in steps Miles Johns. And I think this is going to be a fun fight. Um, you know, Cody Gibson went out there um, last year against Brad Katona back in August and put on my, one of my personal favorite fights of 2023. That was just a back and forth, all out war. Uh, Cody Gibson showed a ton of heart. Uh, Cody Gibson landed 164 significant strikes to Brad Katona's 160, and he lost that fight. It was the Ultimate Fighter finale, right? And that fight was so awesome that Dana White decided that he was going to side. Uh, he was going to sign uh, Cody Gibson, even though he lost the fight. Because how could you not? I mean, that was a phenomenal fight, and um, if he brings that every single time, I mean, it's, it's a fun fighter to watch, right? So, yeah, that was a very fun fight there. Although he did lose. Miles Johns is a guy that I think is a very good fighter, but you know, he can be a little bit low volume. He does have a wrestling background, but you know, thus far in the UFC, only completing takedowns at a 21% accuracy, it's not been great. And I'm not sure he's going to be able to be able to go out there and wrestle here against Cody Gibson. Maybe he lands a takedown or two. I'm not a big fan of the cardio of Miles Johns, especially him coming in here on short notice as well. And I'm also a little bit iffy on the durability of Miles Johns. 13-2 uh, and two is two losses coming inside the distance. I think Gibson's the more durable guy. Gibson's as durable as they come. So I think it's a close fight. I think it's a very close fight here. I'm going to go with Cody Gibson. I like the volume of Cody Gibson. I think he has that dog in him. I think he has that cardio. I think he has that durability of advantage he's the guy with the full camp here so I'll say Miles Johns probably has some success early I just kind of feel like Cody Gibson's going to take over as the fight goes on uh win that second and then finish uh, Miles Johns in the third round so give me Cody Gibson to pull off the upset and get it done by third round knockout moving on we got Ricardo Ramos going against Julian Rosa. A very fun fight here. Uh, I believe this is still on the uh, the prelims, and it's not even the it's not even the featured prelim. So this, is, in my opinion, is like one of the best fights of the card, and it's on the the prelims, which is kind of interesting. But we got Ricardo Ramos, 28 years old, five foot nine, with a 72 inch reach, 16 and five, and two and three in his last five fights. Julian Arosa, 34 years old, six foot one, with a 74 and a half inch reach, 28 and 11, and three and two in his last five fights we'll look at the odds ricardo ramos is the favorite opening up mine or opening up plus 135 currently minus 150 julian arosa open up minus 155 currently plus 130 so yeah fun fight here uh julian arosa has i don't think ever been in a boring fight like this guy always brings it win or lose but um the problem with julian arosa is he's kind of falling into like the matt schnell 
territory for me in terms of durability. Like, this is a guy who's been knocked out seven times at featherweight, which, you know, at featherweight, it's, you know, there's not a ton of finishes at featherweight. Like, a lot of featherweight fights go the distance. So for him to, to get finished seven times at featherweight is is kind of uh, kind of concerning. Um, but, you know, this is a guy in Erosa who's been knocked out six times in the UFC in general. And that, you just don't see that. Like, even, like, Malcolm Gordon, Jason, wait, like, they haven't been, have been knocked out six times. Like, that's that's kind of crazy to me. But, um, yeah, um, Julian Arosa is probably, I don't want to say the, the better fighter, maybe. I think skill for skill, these guys are close. I think there's stuff to like about both these guys. It's just, at any point in time, Ricardo Ramos can land something that, that ends the fight. So... Although Julian Arosa, I think, you know, a little bit more vol- high, higher volume, a little bit more activity, he's just so hittable. Like, I think Julian Arosa's striking defense is 47%. You know, if you're going to have terrible striking defense, you got to at least have a chin, and, and he doesn't. So I just see, like, at some point, Ramos probably lands something and knocks him out. Julian Arosa's not getting any younger. He's coming off of back-to-back knockout losses. He got knocked out by Alex Caceres, who's knocking out nobody. Got knocked out by Fernando Padilla. So, yes, Chin's not getting any better. So, yeah, I'm just going to go with Ricardo Ramos here. I feel like Julian Arosa is a very live dog. He's always a live dog. He'll always fight for your money. But if you don't have a chin, you don't have a chin. So, I'm taking Ricardo Ramos. I'll take him to win this fight by first-round knockout. All right, next we got the featured prelim here. We got Trey Ogden going against Kurt Hollibaugh. We got Trey Ogden, 34 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach, 16-6, and and 2-2 in one no contest in his last five fights. Kurt Holliball, 37 years old, 5'11", with a 73-inch reach, 20-7, and 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 3-2 and in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and we have Trey Ogden opening up minus 150, currently minus 150. Kurt Holliball opening up plus 130, currently plus 130. So Kurt Holliball was also on the Ultimate Fighter with um, Brad Katona and uh, Cody Gibson and them. And he won his fight against uh, Austin Hubbard. And I thought that was a a great win against Austin Hubbard. Austin Hubbard's a guy that is very tough, very durable. And Kurt Holliball was able to go out there and and submit him in the second round. It was a a great performance there. Now he's taking on Trey Ogden, who is just very, very hard to get a read on. Like This guy's whole career makes zero sense to me. So he comes into the UFC against Jordan Levitt, and he gets outstruck against Jordan Levitt in pretty much every single round. He gets outstruck 69 to 41, and he gets outstruck 69 to 38 at distance. Like it makes just zero sense, right? Like I had a bet on on Trey Ogden against Jordan Levitt. I thought it was a good matchup for him. I thought he could maybe even get takedowns. Like, Jordan Levitt's takedown defense is 30%, and Trey Ogden went one for four on takedowns. Like, that matchup still makes no sense to me till this day. And then after that, he goes against Daniel Zellhuber, and he went, he went from getting outstruck massively at distance against Jordan Levitt to, to outstriking Daniel Zellhuber at distance. Like, sometimes MMA just, just makes zero sense. Like, what sense does, does that make? So, yeah, I got burnt there as well. Uh, then he loses to Ignacio Bahamones. He didn't even show up in that fight. Gets outlanded 99-42. to And then he beats Nicholas Moda. They call it a no contest, overturn it, because of an early stoppage by the referee. Referee mistake there. This is an interesting matchup. Um, Trey Ogden has phenomenal fight IQ. He's kind of like a Kyle Nelson in a way where he's... I don't want to call him boring, but he just really slows down the fight. He really slows down the fight. He slows down his opponents. He, like, hypnotizes his opponents, right? He slows it down, and that, that's good. I mean, it's not exciting to watch. Um, I don't think any of Trey Ogden's fights have really been exciting thus far in the UFC, but he's going out there and, and having some success. So, yeah, uh, Kurt Holliball, kind of the complete opposite. Kurt Holliball is kind of like a wild man who's going to come forward trying to land big shots. You know, Trey Ogden, probably the, definitely the more technical striker as well. I'm curious to see what happens when this fight goes to the mat, though, because both these guys are black belts in BJJ. Both these guys are very good grapplers. But Trey Ogden's actually been submitted three times in his career, uh, twice against Thomas Gifford and twice by, by guillotine against Thomas Gifford, both in a minute 
And Kurt Holleball is a guy that has a very good guillotine. On top of that, has very good other submissions as well. Kurt Holleball is no joke on the mat. So I have a feeling we're going to have a, a close fight on the feet. I don't feel like either fighter is going to really pull away in a, in a Trey Ogden fight on the feet. But if this fight hits the mat, I just feel like it's going to be very interesting here. I think it's another close fight, a fight that I think can really go either way. Um, but I'm going to take Holleball here to win this fight. I think he's going to... I'll say he gets a sub. I'll say he submits Trey Ogden at some point. I just think Holabaugh's so dangerous on the mat, he's going to find something here. Ogden's been submitted three times, and it's not like these submission losses were so long ago. Um, I think his last submission loss was maybe 2019, 2020, which I guess at this point it is a while ago. But still, you know, Kurt Holabaugh's no joke on the mat. I'll say he finds a sub here in the second round. So give me Kurt Holabaugh to win this fight by second round submission. But if Trey Ogden goes out there and hypnotizes Kurt Holabaugh and this fight's completely awful and terrible and he wins a decision that would not shock me either all right let's move on to the main card we got Fernando Padilla going against Luis uh, Pujello we got Padilla who is 27 years old six foot one with a 76 inch reach 15 and five and three and two in his last five fights Pujello he is 29 years old five foot ten with a 69 and a half inch reach eight and one and five and oh in his last five fights Fernando Padilla uh, opened up minus 155, currently minus 160. Pujello opened up plus 135, currently plus 140. This is a fun fight. I see why they put it as the main card opener, and it's because it's a Luis Pujello fight. This is a guy that is just a dog. He's going to come forward the entire time. Um, he's going to show no regards to his own safety in there. He has zero striking defense whatsoever. He will let you hit him in the face. And He went out there on the contender series against Robbie Ring, and yeah, he was looking kind of terrible early on. He was getting pieced up like early on against uh, Robbie Ring a little bit, but a couple minutes in, he started to get going, and then he really started to hurt Robbie Ring, put it on him, and, and finished him viciously on the mat. Had a, like a knee to the body on the ground. It was it was vicious. But yeah, early on, he showed that yeah, he's very very hittable, and I think better fighters will be able to take advantage of that. Like a Fernando Padilla, who's going to have like a six and a half inch reach advantage, who's going to be three inches taller. And yeah, Padilla is a guy that I'm, I'm somewhat high on. I think he's a pretty good fighter. I think the Kyle Nelson fights a one off. I completely just ignore Kyle Nelson fights these days because Kyle Nelson is like I said, like a Trey Ogden. He just, he just hypnotizes his opponents and the fights typically are just awful. Um, you know, in that fight, Padilla was just like, he landed strikes at a 34% accuracy. Like shout out to Kyle Nelson um, just being able to, to do that to, uh, to guys these days and especially Padilla. And that was a big upset win there. But yeah, I think Padilla probably gets back on track here against Luis Pajalo. I think Padilla is going to have the better cardio, the better grappling, but, uh, Pajalo is going to come forward. He's going to come forward. He's going to make it a war. Both guys are super tough. Like Pajalo, he has an absolute chin. He will eat punches with his face and, and smile at you. Padilla, same thing, next level durable, 20 fights, never been finished. Um, these guys have six losses, all six come by decision, but I think Padilla might break Pujello here. I think it might be like an attritional damage type thing where Padilla just hits him in the face so many times that the ref is going to step in at some point. So I'm going Padilla. I'm going Padilla to win this fight by third round knockout. This fight should be fun. It should be, it should be an absolute war, but I'll go Padilla, KO3. Moving on, we got Billy Corantello going against Yusuf Salah. We got Billy Q, 35 years old, five foot ten, with a 70 inch reach, 18 and five, and three and two in his last five fights. Yusuf Salah, 27 years old, five foot ten, with a 75 inch reach, 13 five and one, three one and one, in his last five fights. Billy Q opened up minus 300, currently minus 160. Salah opening up plus 250, currently plus 140. This fight confuses me a little bit. Um, it was supposed to be Billy Corantillo versus Gabriel Miranda, which was a phenomenal fight. Like that would have been probably my favorite fight on the card and then in steps Zalao and it's it's no longer my favorite fight on the card um I mean Yusuf Zalao I think is an incredible talent doesn't have the most exciting fights in the world but very talented fighter uh really good striker in Zalao uh solid grappling as well the problem with Zalao is I think he has all this talent he just doesn't he just can't seem to put it together in the UFC like you watch Zalao outside the UFC he's a killer He's finished every single win outside the UFC. They even cut him after the Blackshear draw. This guy has three finishes since then. Um, a 100% finish rate outside the UFC. Inside the UFC, he can't finish anyone. Not even, you know, Peter Barrett. Not even Austin Lingo. 
You know, he's taken all these guys to decision. Every single fight for Zalao in the UFCs went to decision. All seven fights. So, um, and then he's low volume in the UFC as well. But outside the UFC, you watch him. He's pressuring. He's letting his hands go. He looks good. He looks dangerous. And he's finishing guys. But inside the UFC, it just, I don't know. I don't know what's what, what the deal is with the uses allow. So, yeah, I mean, Billy Quarantillo, I think all the volume's in favor of Billy Q. Like, this is a guy that's landing almost eight strikes per minute compared to Zalao, who's like at 2.75. So, yeah, all the volume's in favor of, of Billy Q. Um, I think this fight probably does go to decisions. Allow is next level durable. And Billy Q is a guy that typically does drown you and finish you late. And he can break you. He can break guys with poor cardio. Allows is not that guy. Allows a guy that trains in Denver. His cardio is always on point, always will be on point, even though he's on short notice. So Allow so will be there the entire 15 minutes. I just think he's going to get outworked. Simple as that. I think Billy Q is going to outwork him. He outworks pretty much everybody. I don't think Allow has the stopping power to. To, to make him pay for how hittable he is as well. So, yeah, should just be Billy Q out working Zalau, just doing more across 15 minutes. I'm glad Zalau is back in the UFC. But if he loses this fight in the UFC, he'll be 0-4-1 in his last five fights inside the UFC. So kind of a tough matchup to take. I mean, a Billy Q matchup to take is, is tough in general, but on short notice, it's very tough as well. So, yeah, give me, give me Billy Q here. I'll take Billy Q to win by decision. All right, next we have the People's Main Event. Um, this is going to be like the uh, the war of the week where people are very confident on either side. Kind of reminds me of like the Dalgarian Rodriguez fight last week where everybody was confident in, in their guy. Same thing here, it looks like. We got Peyton Talbot going against Cameron Simon. We got Talbot, 25 years old, 5'10", with a 70-inch reach, 7-0 and 5-0 and in his last five fights. Cameron Simon, 23 years old, 5'8", with a 67-inch reach, 9-1 and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. This opened up a pick em. Peyton Talbot is now minus 150, and, and Cameron Simon is plus 130. And yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is, um, you know, what's the game plan here of, of Cameron Simon? You know, is his game plan going to be to go out there and, and, and strike with Peyton Talbot for 15 minutes? If that's the case, I, I really hate his chances here because I don't think that's happening. Although I think Cameron Simon's a very good striker, I just really like the striking of Peyton Talbot. I like the volume of Talbot. Um, he has solid power as well, solid pressure, solid pace, really good cardio, really good durability. I don't think Simon's going to be able to outstrike pay and Talbot across 15 minutes so but if Simon grapples I think that's where it could, could potentially get interesting because Talbot's takedown defense I'm like if you want like in some fights it looks really good and then in some fights it looks just like non-existent uh he was able to go out there and fight Reyes Cortez on the on the contender series and, and in that fight it like looked elite Reyes Cortez who does have a wrestling background went one for 17 so I think that's good so I think he's making improvements but, you know, before that fight, he is getting taken down, like, with ease, which is concerning. And then even in his last fight against Nick Aguirre, who was, is not UFC caliber, um, Aguirre was able to take Talbot down in the first round and, and control him for the entire round. So that that is a concern. Like, that cannot be ignored. But, you know, Aguirre was 2-for-10 uh, on takedowns, so Talbot was able to stuff 8. So, yeah, if, if Simon is able to get the fight down to the mat, you know, Simon might be able to have, a, like, a grappling advantage, but... I kind of think this fight does primarily play out on the feet. And if it does, I, I got to go Talbot here. You know, this is a guy in Talbot who's going to have a, a both a height and reach advantage. I think a volume advantage. I think a power advantage. I think Simon has good cardio, but I think Talbot has a cardio advantage. I think Talbot has a durability advantage as well. So, yeah, a lot of reasons to like Talbot here for me. Um, so I'm going to pick him to win this fight. And I think he could potentially get it done late. That's typically what he does. This guy has zero first round finishes. Um, so he's like a, a two, three type guy. So I could see him maybe getting Cameron Simon out of there late, but Simon's a tough dude. So I'll say, I'll say Talbot by decision here. And yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like I wonder, I want, I want to know what a Simon's game plan is. Like if, if his game plan is to grapple, I think this fight's just like a lot more interesting to me. So, but I'm going to go Talbot here. I'll take Talbot to win by defi- by, de- by decision in this one. Next, we got Edmund Shabazian going against AJ Dobson. We got Shabazian, 26 years old, six foot two with a 75 inch reach, 12 and four, and one and four in his last five fights. Uh, AJ Dobson, 32 years old, six foot one, with a 76 inch reach, 70, seven and two, 
in three and two in his last five fights. Shabazian, he is a favorite, opened up minus 185, currently minus 195. Dobson opened up plus 160, currently plus 170. Um, yeah, I mean, this should be, you know, Edmund Shabazian here, you know, winning this fight. Uh, Edmund Shabazian's a guy that there was high hopes for him, you know, a while ago. He came to the UFC very young, like, what, he came into the UFC, like, at, like, 18, 19, 20? Um, came into the UFC back in, like, 2018, so seven years ago, 19 years old. And, yeah, there's a lot of high hopes. Um, he had a, a good win against um, Darren Stewart, Charles Bird, Jack Marshman, that Brad Tavares win. I went back and watched that, and I think it was Joe Rogan who said, um, after he knocked out Tavares, he was like, if there were any questions about Edmund Shabazian, they have been answered tonight, which I think is hilarious, because after that fight, he went 1-4 and four in his next five fights, um, losing to Derek Brunson, Jack Hermanson, Nazarene Imavov, and Anthony Hernandez. His one win coming in against Dolce Langenbola. So I think they might have pushed him a little bit too quickly. I think they bumped him up the ladder a little bit too quickly, and he lost to some very good fighters like Brunson, Hermanson, Imavov, and Hernandez are all very very, very good fighters in the division. So, yeah, no shame in those losses. And I think this is a this should be a, a good winnable matchup for him against AJ Dobson, who I don't know kind of has let me down thus far in the UFC. He's a little bit low volume. Um, you know, he can wrestle a tad, but you know I, I feel like it should be Edmund Shabazi and landing a little bit more, landing a little bit harder, being the better striker, being more active on the feet. I guess Dobson, in theory, could potentially get this fight down to the mat, but Edmund Shabazian, I don't think he has, like, terrible takedown defense. I just think he's going against Anthony Hernandez, Jack Hermanson, and Derek Brunson is, is the problem, but his takedown defense doesn't look bad, so I'm not sure Dobson's going to be able to have um, success taking him down. The obvious concern here with Edmund Shabazian is the cardio. Like, if this fight gets extended, which I actually do think it gets extended, you know, seven and a half minutes in, ten minutes in, this guy seems to crumble. And that could be the case here. But I'll take him to hold on. I'm going to take Shabazian here to, to win these first two rounds and then kind of grease out the third round and, and win this fight by decision, 29-28. Um, yeah, should be a winnable fight for Edmund, but you know, laying minus one ninety five on, I'm not sure I can get there. But I do think he's the, the better fighter. I really do believe that. So give me Edmund to win this fight by decision. Next, we got the co-main event. Yeah, you heard that right. Um, at least as of now, this is the co-main event. We got Carl Williams going against Justin Taffa. We got Carl Williams, 34 years old, six foot three, with a 79 inch reach, nine and one, five and zero in his last five fights. Justin Taffa, 30 years old, six foot, with a 74 inch reach, 70, seven and three. In three, one, and one no contest in his last five fights. Carl Williams opened at minus 265, currently minus 170. Justin Taffa opened up plus 205, currently plus 145. So there was the whole situation where Justin Taffa was hurt against uh, Marcos Ujeri de Lima and then in steps uh, Junior Taffa. And then now, you know, fast forward like a month, um, Junior Taffa obviously had to pull out because he got destroyed against uh, de Lima. In steps Justin Taffa. So they did the old uh, the switcheroo there. And, um, yeah, um, it's a weird fight because Carl Williams should be able to get takedowns here whenever he wants. It's just on the feet, like, Justin Taffa has that that death touch. Like, if Justin Taffa does land once, could be in any round, uh, he could potentially put out Carl Williams. But there's no doubt in my mind, like, Carl Williams is going to be able to take down Taffa. And I have a funny feeling that we haven't seen Taffa taken down. We haven't seen him off his back. I just have a funny feeling that if Taffa does get taken down, he's not really going to offer much at all on the ground. So I'm kind of leaning Williams here um, to get takedowns, get control time. Williams is a good wrestler, a very good wrestler. Should have no problem getting takedowns here against Taffa. The control is not the best. The cardio is not the best, but I think he can do enough here across 15 minutes. But, yeah, anytime this fight's on the feet, you're going to be holding your breath if you have a Carl Williams ticket. I won't be having one, but if you do bet him, you'll be holding your breath. But I think you should go out there and win a decision here. Justin Taffa has some just atrocious losses when you look through it. In the UFC, I mean, loss to, to Jared Vandera is, is inexcusable. Um, I still can't believe that. You know, This guy lost to Jared Vandera, lost to Carlos Philippe, inexcusable. And then he lost to Jorgen DeCastro, which is even more just just terrible losses. The wins come against Hunsucker, Juan Adams, Parker Porter, and Austin Lane. Those aren't good wins. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Justin Taffa, 
puncher's chance, heavyweight fight, but you know, Carl Williams should be able to, to ground this fight over 15 and, and win a decision here. So Carl Williams by decision. Next, we have the main event. I did do a main event deep dive. If you guys want to check it out on the channel, went a little bit more in depth here. But we have Rose Namajunas going against Amanda Hebos. We got Rose, uh, 31 years old, five foot five with a 65 inch reach, 11 and six, three and two in her last five fights. Hebos, 30 years old, five foot three with a 66 inch reach, 12 and four, and three and two in her last five fights. So I put the odds in like 15 minutes or so before I did the. Uh, my main event breakdown and the odds like moved. So actually it's Rose like minus 275 now. I'm not sure what's going on, but she's minus 275 now actually. And he boss is currently plus 235. So I'm not sure if Amanda, he boss is fighting this fight like blindfolded, but that is some wild line movement. And I'm, I'm picking Rose. Don't get me wrong, but laying minus 300 on Rose at this point of her career is, is certainly terrifying. But yeah, I got to go Rose here. I mean, I, I just think she's the much better fighter. And it's not like she's like old or nothing. It's just um, she's actually only one year older than Amanda Hiba. She's only 31. It's just I always question the the mentality of Rose Namajunas because some fights she shows up and she looks like the best fighter in the division. And then some fights she shows up and, and lands like – Nothing against Carla Sparza across 25 minutes. I mean, she's had some weird performances, um, and that one especially was just a weird performance. But she's uh, fighting at flyweight here uh, for the second time in her career after the the Manon Fiora fight, which she made a really good account of herself in that debut against Manon Fiora. She went out there. I think she even outlanded Fiora in terms of the strikes, like in two of the rounds. And she even got hurt in that fight, I believe, as well. So yeah, great performance um, in a loss for Rose Namajunas against somebody. And Man on Fiora, who's fighting Aaron Blanchfield next week at Atlantic City, uh, that was a good loss. Um, and then you got Amanda Hebos, who you look at her wins, and they're not great. I mean, I think her best wins probably like either Vivian Ariujo or uh, Mackenzie Dern, but Mackenzie Dern was coming off like a big layoff and a pregnancy. So, yeah, I don't know. And then she has wins over like Verna Jandaroba, Paige Van Zant, Randa Marcos, Emily Whitmire, just. Luana Panera, I don't think is that great. Like if she beats Rose Namajunas, it's her best win by a mile. Whereas if Rose beats Amanda Hebos, it's just another win. Like Rose has beat Zhang Wei Li, she's beat Jessica Andrade, she's beat Joanna in Jacek, she's beat Tisha Torres, Michelle Waterson, she's beaten very, very good fighters. So as long as Rose comes in here, you know, motivated, ready to go, like yeah, I, I think it's a really good fight for her. I think she's the better striker. I think Hebos obviously has probably the, the BJJ advantage, but Rose is definitely a good grappler in her own right. She can definitely hang if she gets taken down. Um, you know, Rose has went 25 minutes on several different occasions, whereas with Hebos, this is going to be her first five-round fight as far as I'm concerned. And then in terms of durability, Hebos is probably one of the least durable female fighters on the roster. She's been knocked out three times. Um, and Rose is, is obviously quite durable herself. So, yeah, um, I, all signs are pointing to Rose, uh, not at minus 300, but in terms of a pick, all signs are pointing to, to Rose for me. So I'm going to take Rose Namajunas to win this fight and to win it by decision. There you guys have it. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like on your way out, subscribe to the channel, check out dfsbythenumbers.com. There you'll find all my other content. Um Looking at a couple spots this week, a couple bets, um, a couple props, a couple dogs, but it's not going to be a, a card I'm heavily invested in. Next week is a completely different story. I'm going to try to start digging into these Atlantic City fights like Tuesday, like early, early. And then, of course, I want to dig into 300 very early as well. So I might get off some early bets. But, um, yeah, guys, thanks so much for watching. Be on the lookout for more content throughout the week, and we'll talk to you guys very soon. Best of luck for UFC Vegas 89. Rose Nami Yunus versus Amanda Hebos. See you guys later.